This is Ziki Zaborski. Ziki Zaborski presents Slam, written by A. E. Van Vogt, narrated by Samuel Charles Smith. From the original version of four parts, published in the September, October, November, and December editions of the astounding science fiction magazine of 1940. Chapter 14 it took seven years, and Jommy Cross had been 26 for two months on that tremendous day when the tenderless slant organization struck with unexpected, unimaginable violence. It was hot, with a sultry, oppressive heat, as he came slowly down the veranda steps and paused on the pathway that divided the garden. He was thinking with a quiet, gentle thought of Kathleen, and of his long-dead mother and father. It was not grief, or even sadness, that swayed him but a deep philosophical sense of the profound tragedy of life. But no introspection could dull his senses. With abnormal, unhurried clarity, he was aware of his surroundings. Of all the developments in himself during those seven years, it was this marvellous perception of anything that marked his growth toward maturity. Nothing escaped him. Heat waves danced against the lower reaches of the mountain, twenty miles away, where his spaceship was hidden but no heat mist could bar a vision that saw so many more pictures per split second than the human eye could see. Details penetrated, a hard, bright pattern formed, where a few years before there would have been, even for himself, a blur. A squadron of midges swarmed past Granny, where she knelt by a flower bed. The faint life wave of the tiny flies caressed the supersensitive receptors of his brain. As he stood there, Sounds from remoteness whispered into his ears. Wisps of thought, shadowed by distance, touched his mind. And gradually, in spite of incredible complexity, a kaleidoscope of the life in his valley grew in his mind, a very symphony of impression that rounded beautifully into a coherent whole. Men and women at work, children at play, laughter, tractors moving, trucks, cars, a little farm community meeting another day in the old, old fashion. He stared again at Granny, briefly his mind dissolved into her defenseless brain, and in that instant, so utter was his power of receiving thoughts, it was as if she were another part of his body. A crystal clear picture of the dark earth she was looking at flashed from her mind to his. A tall flower directly under her gaze loomed big in her mind and in his. As he watched, her hand came into view holding a small black bug. Triumph squirmed a course through her brain as, with a sharp squeeze, she squashed the insect, then complacently wiped her stained fingers in the dirt. Granny, Cross ejaculated, can't you suppress your murderous instincts? The old lady glanced up at him, and there was a belligerent thrust in her wrinkled, kindly face that was distinctly reminiscent of the old granny. Nonsense, she snapped. For ninety years gone now, I've killed the little devils, and my mother before me had it in for him too. He he. Her giggle sounded senile. Cross frowned faintly. Granny had thrived physically in this semi-tropical west coast climate, but he was not altogether satisfied with his hypnotic reconstruction of her mind. She was very old, of course, but her constant use of certain phrases, such as the one about what she and her mother before her had done, was too mechanical. He had impressed the idea upon her in the first place to fill the enormous gap left by the uprooting of her evil memories. But, well, one of these days he'd have to try again. He started to turn away, and it was at that moment that the warning tingled into his brain, a sharp pulsing of faraway outside thoughts. Airplanes, people were thinking. So many planes. Years now since Jommy Cross had implanted the hypnotic suggestion that everybody who saw anything unusual in the valley was to signal to their subconscious without themselves being aware of the act. The fruits of that precaution came now on the wave after wave of warning from dozens of minds. And then he saw the planes, specks, diving over the mountain, heading in his general direction. And like a striking mongoose, his mind lashed out toward them, reaching for the minds of the pilots. Taut hell, brain shields of tendrils slams met that one searching glance. He leaped forward in a single flowing movement. In full racing stride, he snatched Granny from the ground, and then he was in the house. The ten-point steel door of that ten-point steel house swung shut, even as a great glistening helicopter plane 
settled like a gigantic bird of prey among the flowers of Granny's garden. Cross thought tensely, a plane in every farmyard. That means they don't know exactly which one I'm in. But now the spaceships will arrive to finish the job. Thura. Well, so had he been Thura, and it was obvious that now his hand was forced, he must push his own plan to the utmost limit, and with the uttermost determination. He was conscious of supreme confidence, and there was still not a doubt in him. Doubt and dismay came sharply a minute later, as he stared into his underground visiplate. The battleships and cruisers were there all right, but something else too. Another ship. A ship. The monster filled half of the visiplate, and its wheel-shaped bulk sprawled across the lower quarter of the sky. A half-mile circle of ship, ten million tons of metal floating down lighter than air, like a buoyant, flattened balloon, gigantic, immeasurably malignant in its sheer threat of unlimited power. It came alive. A hundred-yard beam of white fire flared from its massive wall, and the solid top of the mountain dissolved before that frightful thrust. His mountain, where his ship, his life, was hidden, destroyed by atomic energy. Cross stood quite still there, on the rug of the steel floor of that steel laboratory. Wisps of human incoherency from every direction fumbled at his brain. He flung up his mind shield, and that distracting confusion of outside thought was cut off abruptly. Behind him, Granny moaned in gentle terror. In the distance above him, sledgehammer blows were lashing at his impregnable cottage, but the dim bedlam of noise touched him not. He stood there in a world of personal silence, a world of swift, quiet, uninterrupted thought. Atomic energy? If they had it too, why did they bother him? A thousand coordinating thoughts leaped up to form the simple answer. They didn't have his perfect type of atomic energy, only a crude development of the old type cyclotron. That alone could explain so much size. A ten million ton cyclotron, capable of a wild and deadly spray of energy. And by God, he'd have to hurry or they'd have him. Muscles galvanized, his mind shield went down. He laughed coldly and whirled toward the great instrument board that spread across the entire end of the laboratory. A switch clicked, pointers set rigid, and dancing needles told the story of his spaceship out there under that dissolving mountain. The spaceship which they were obviously trying to destroy to prevent his escape. But now the needles told of a ship aflame with life from nose to stern, a great machine automatically burrowing deeper into the ground, and at the same time heading unerringly toward his laboratory. A dial spun, and a whole bank of needles in their transparent cases danced from zero to the first fractional point and wavered there, and they too told a story. The story of glittering atomic projectors rearing up from the ground where they had been hidden so long, and as he grasped the precision instrument that was his aiming device, twenty invincible guns out there swung in perfect synchronization. The hairline sights swung across the unmissable spread of that ship's bulk. Abruptly, then for a bare instant, he hesitated. What was his purpose against these ruthless enemies? After all, he didn't want to bring that monster machine to Earth. He didn't want to create a situation where slans and humans might launch into a furious war for the possession of the wreck. There was no doubt that the human beings would fight, and fight with a fearless ferocity. Their great mobile guns could still hurl shells capable of piercing any metal in the possession of the slans. And if any of those ships with their superior armaments ever fell into human hands, then it would be no time at all before they too had spaceships and the Devil's War would be on. No, he didn't want that. And he didn't want to destroy the ship because he didn't want to kill the tenderless slans who were in it. For after all, tenderless slans did represent a law and order which he respected, and because they were a great race and definitely kindred to him, they merited mercy. Before that clarification, hesitation fled. Straight at the roaring center of that immense cyclotron, Cross aimed his battery of synchronized weapons, his thumb pressed down the fire button. Above him, the half-mile of spiral-shaped ship recoiled like an elephant struck an intolerable blow. It rocked madly, like a ship in stormy seas, and briefly, as it swung sickeningly, he saw blue sky through a gaping hole and realized his victory. He had cut that vast spiral from end to end. 
In every turn of it was now a hopelessly diffusing leak. No stream of atoms, however accelerated, could run that gauntlet unmutilated. The power of the cyclotron was smashed. But all the implications of that immense ship remained. Frowning, Cross watched the ship poise for a moment shakily. Slowly, it began to recede, its anti-gravity plates apparently full on. Up, up it mounted, its size yielding with reluctance to the fading effects of distance. At fifty miles it was still bigger than the battleships that were nosing down toward that still green still unharmed valley, and now the implications were clearer, colder, deadlier. Their possession of atomic energy, however crude, proved they must have instruments for detecting the presence of a machine using it anywhere. He had such instruments. They must have them. That meant their instruments, poor though they must be, lacking as they did the minus energy principle, must have spotted his valley months ago, which meant they had waited until they could attack in one titanic organized battle, with the one purpose of forcing him out where they could follow him night and day by means of their instruments, and by sheer weight of numbers and weight of guns, destroy him. Dispassionately, Cross turned to Granny. I'm going to leave you here. Follow my instructions to the letter. Five minutes from now, you will go up the way we came down, closing all the metal doors behind you. You will then forget all about this laboratory. Every inch of it is going to be destroyed, so you might as well forget. If men question you, you will be senile, but at other times you will be normal. I'm leaving you to face that danger because I'm no longer sure, in spite of my precautions, that I can come out of this alive. He felt a chill and personal interest in the knowledge that the day of action had arrived. The tendril of slans might intend this attack on him to be but part of a vaster design that included their long-delayed assault on Earth. Whatever happened, his plans were as complete as he could make them, and though it was four years too soon, he must now force the issue to the limit of his power. He was on the run, and there could be no turning back, for behind him was swift death. Cross's ship nosed out of the little river and launched towards space on a long, slanting climb. It was important that he do not go invisible until the slants actually saw that he was out of the valley before they raised it in mad, futile search. But first, one thing he must do. His hand plunged home a switch. His narrowed gaze fastened on the rear visiplate that showed the valley falling away below. At a score of points on that green floor, he counted them in lightning calculation. White flame blazed up, a strange, splotchy-looking fire. Down there, every weapon, every atomic machine was turning on itself in a fury of destruction. Fire chambers were burning out, metal running molten in that devouring violence of tormented energy. The white glow was still there as he turned away a few seconds later, grimly content. Now let them search through that ravaged, twisted metal. Let their scientists labor to bring life to a secret they craved so desperately and to obtain which they had come out where human beings could see some of their powers. In every burned out cache in that valley, they would find exactly nothing. The destruction of all that was so precious to the attackers required a fraction of a minute. But in that moment of time he was seen. Four dead black battleships turned toward him simultaneously, and then hovered uncertainly as he actuated the mechanism that made his vessel invisible. He sped on, faster, faster, to take advantage of their confusion. Abruptly, their possession of atom energy detectors was shown. The ships fell in behind him unerringly. Alarm bells showed others ahead, closing toward him. It was the unmatchable atomic drivers that saved him from that vast fleet, so many vessels that he could not even begin to count them. And all that could come near turned their deadly projectors where their detector instruments pointed. Missed because, during the very instant they spotted him, his machine flashed out of the range of their most massive guns. All the driving strength of their crowded rockets had no chance against the full-driven thrust of the energy of energies. Completely invisible, travelling at miles and miles per second, his ship headed for Mars. He must have struck mines, but that didn't matter now. The devouring disintegration rays that poured out from the walls of his great machine ate up the mines before they could explode, and simultaneously destroyed every light wave that could have revealed his craft to alert eyes out there in the blaze of the sun. There was only one difference. The mines were smashed before they reached his ship. Light being in a wave state as it flashed up, 
could only be destroyed during that fraction of instant when it touched his ship and started to bounce. At the very moment of bouncing, its speed reduced. The corpuscles that basically composed it lengthened according to the laws of the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction theory. At that instant of almost quiescence, the fury of the sun rays were blotted out by the disintegrators. And because light must touch the walls first, and so could be absorbed as readily as ever, his visiplates were unaffected. The full picture of everything came through, even as he hurtled on, unseen, invisible. His ship seemed to stand still in the void, except that gradually Mars became larger. At a million miles it was a great glowing ball as big as the moon seen from Earth, and it grew like an expanding balloon until its dark bulk filled half the sky and lost its redness. Continents took form, mountains, seas, incredible gorges, rock-strewn and barren stretches of flat land. Grimmer grew the picture, deadlier, every forsaken aspect of that gnarled old planet. Mars, seen through an electric telescope at 30,000 miles, was like a too old human being, withered, bony, ugly, cold-looking, drooling with age, enormously repellent. The dark area that was Mare Samarium showed as a fanged, terrible sea. Silent, almost tideless, the waters lay under the eternal blue-dark skies, but no ship could ever breast those murderously placid waters. Endless miles of jagged rocks broke the surface. There were no patterns, no channels, simply a jangled incoherence of deadly sea that shared mile on mile with remorseless rock. Finally, Cross saw the city making a strange shimmering picture under its vast roof of glass. Then a second city showed, and a third. Far, far past Mars he plunged, his every motor dead, not a fraction of atomic energy diffusing from any part of his ship. That was caution, pure and simple. There could be no fear of detector instruments in these vast distances. At last, the gravitational field of the planet began to check that mad flight. Slowly, the long machine yielded to the inexorable pull and began to fall toward the night side of the globe. It was a slow business. Earth days fled into Earth weeks. But finally, he turned on not his atomic energy, but the anti-gravity plates, which he had not used since he had installed his atomic drives. For days and days then, while centrifugal action of the planet cushioned his swift fall, he sat without sleep, staring into the visiplates. Five times the ugly balls of dark metal that were mines flashed toward him. Each time he actuated for brief seconds his all-devouring wall disintegrators and waited for the ships that might have spotted his momentary use of that devastating force. A dozen times his alarm bells clanged and lights flashed on his visiplates, but no ships came within range. Below him, the planet grew vast and filled every horizon with its dark immensity. There were not many landmarks on this night portion aside from the cities. Here and there, however, splashes of light showed some kind of habitation and activity. And at last, he found what he wanted, a mere dot of flame, like a candle fluttering in remote darkness. It turned out to be a small mine, and the light came from the outhouse, where lived the four tenderless slants who attended the mine's completely automatic machinery. It was almost dawn before Cross returned to his ship, satisfied that this was what he wanted. A mist of blackness lay like a black cloth over the planet the following night, when once again Cross landed his ship in the ravine that led toward the mine head. Not a shadow stirred ahead of him, not a sound invaded the silence as he edged forward to the mouth of the mine. Gingerly, he took out one of the metal cases which protected his hypnotism crystals, inserted the atomically unstable glass-like object into a crack of a rock entrance, jerked off the metal covering, and raced off before his own body could affect the sluggish thing. In the black of a ravine, he waited. In twenty minutes, a door in the outhouse opened. The flood of light from within revealed the outlines of a tall young man. Then the door closed. A torch blazed in the hand of the shadowed figure, glared along the path he was following, and brought a flash of reflected flame from the hypnotism crystal. The man walked toward it curiously and stopped to examine it. His thought ran along the surface of his casually protected mind. Funny, that crystal wasn't there this morning, he shrugged. 
Some rock probably jarred loose, and the crystal was behind it. He stared at it, abruptly startled by its fascination. Suspicion leaped into his alert mind. He pondered the thing with a cold, tense logic, and died for the shelter of the cavern as Cross's paralyzing ray flicked him from the ravine. He fell unconscious just inside the cave. Cross rushed forward, and in a few minutes had the man far down the ravine, out of all possible earshot of the camp. But even during those first minutes, his brain was reaching through the other's shattered mind shield, searching. It was slow work, because moving around in an unconscious mind was like walking underwater. There was so much resistance. But suddenly he found what he wanted, the corridor made by the man's sharp awareness of the pattern of the crystal. Swiftly, Cross followed the mind path to its remote end in the complex root sources of the brain. A thousand paths streamed loosely before him, scattering in every direction. Grimly, with careful yet desperate speed, he followed them, ignoring the obviously impossible ones, and then once more like a burglar who opens safes by listening for the faint click that reveals he has reached another stage in the solution of the combination. Once more, a key corridor stretched before him. Eight key paths, fifteen minutes, and the combination was his. The brain was his. Under his ministrations, the man, whose name was Miller, revived with a gasp. Instantly, he closed the mind shield tight over his mind. Cross snapped. Don't be so illogical. Lower your shield. The shield went down, and in the darkness, the surprised tendril of Slan stared at him. Astonishment flamed through his mind. Hypnotized by heaven, he said, wonderingly. How the devil did you do it? The method can be used only by true slans, Cross replied coolly, so explanations would be idle. A true slan, the other said slowly. Then you're Cross. I'm Cross. I suppose you know what you're doing, Miller went on, but I don't see how you expect to gain anything by your control of me. Abruptly, Miller's mind realized the strangeness, the eeriness of the conversation there in that dark ravine under the black, mist-hidden sky. Only one of the two moons of Mars was visible, a blurred white shape that gleamed remotely from the vast vault of heaven. He said quickly, How is it that I can talk to you, reason with you? I thought hypnotism was a mind-dulling thing that made... Hypnotism, Cross cut in without pausing in his swift exploration of the other's brain, is a science that involves many factors. Full control permits the subject apparently complete freedom, except that his will is under absolute outside domination. But there is no time to waste. His voice grew sharper, his brain withdrew from the other. Tomorrow is your day off. You will go to the Bureau of Statistics and ascertain the name and present location of every man with my physical structure, and... He stopped, because Miller was laughing softly. His mind and voice said, Good heavens, man, I can tell you that right now. They were all spotted after your description came through seven years ago. They're always under observation, they're all married men, and... His voice trailed off. Sardonically, Cross said, Go on. Miller went on reluctantly. There are 27 men altogether who resemble you in very great detail, a surprisingly high average. Go on. One of them, said Miller disconsolately, is married to a woman whose head was absolutely smashed in a spaceship accident last week. They're building up her brain and bone again, but... But that'll take a few weeks, Cross finished for him. The man's name is Barton Corliss. He is located at the Samarium Spaceship Factory and like yourself, goes into the city Samarium every fourth day. There ought to be an enforceable law, Miller said glumly, against people who can read minds. Fortunately, the poor grave receivers will spot you, he finished more cheerfully. A. Eh? Cross spoke sharply. He had already noticed about mind reading in Miller's mind, but it had not seemed applicable. And there have been other more important things to follow up. Coolly, Miller said, and his thought verified every word of it, The poor grave broadcaster broadcasts thoughts, and the poor grave receiver receives them. In Samarium, there's one located every few feet. They're in all the buildings, houses, everywhere. There are protection against snake spies. One indiscreet thought, and finish. Cross was silent. At last, he said, 
One more question, and I want your mind to give off a lot of thoughts in this. I want detail. Yes. How imminent is the attack on Earth? It has been decided, Miller replied precisely, that in view of the failure to destroy you and obtain your secret, control of Earth has become essential, the purpose being to forestall any future danger from anybody. To this end, vast reserves of spaceships are being turned out. The fleet is mobilizing at key points, but the date of attack, though probably decided on, has not yet been announced. What have they planned to do with human beings? To hell with human beings, Miller said coolly. When our own existence is involved, we can't worry about them. The darkness all around seemed deeper, the chill of the night beginning to penetrate even his heated clothes. Instant by instant, Cross's mind grew harder as he examined the implications of Miller's words. War. In a bleak voice, he said, only with the help of the true slans can that attack be stopped, and there are about two places left that they can be, and I'm going to the most probable. The bleak morning dragged. The sun gleamed like a festering sore in the blue-black vastness of the sky, and the sharp black shadows that it cast on the strange deadly land grew narrow, and then began to lengthen again as Mars turned an unfriendly afternoon face to the stark, insistent light. From where Cross's ship crouched in the great chalk cliff, the horizon was a thing of blurred ridges against the shadowed sky. But even from his 2,000-foot height, the nearness of the horizon was markedly noticeable. Twilight threatened, and then at last his patient vigil was rewarded. The small, red-striped, torpedo-shaped object drifted up from the horizon, fire pouring from its rear. The rays of the sinking sun glinted on its dull metallic skin. It darted far to the left of where Cross waited in the machine that, like some beast of prey, lay entunneled in the swelling breast of the white cliff. About three miles, Cross estimated carefully. The actual bulk of the intervening distance would make no difference to the motor that lay silent in the engine room at the back of the ship, ready to give forth its noiseless, stupendous power. Three hundred miles, and that superb motor would vibrate on without strain, without missing a single beat, except that such titanic force could not be unleashed, where its almost unlimited strength might touch ground and tear a monstrous swath out of this already tortured barren land. Three miles, four, five, he made swift adjustments. Then the force of the magnetors flashed across the miles, and simultaneously the idea he had developed during his long trip from Earth took life from a special engine. Radio waves so similar to the vibrations of atomic energy that only an extremely sensitive instrument could have detected the difference sprayed forth from a robot motor that he had set up 500 miles away. For those brief minutes, the whole planet sighed with atomic energy waves. Out there somewhere, tenderless slans must already be plotting the center of that interfering wave. Meantime, his small use of power should go unnoticed. Swiftly, yet gently, the magnetors did their work. The faraway, still-receding ship slowed as if it had run into an elastic net that yielded ever more stubbornly, and finally, the deceleration completed, flung its prey toward the chalk cliff. Effortlessly, using the radio waves as screen for further use of power, Cross withdrew his own ship deeper into the cliff's bulging belly, widening the natural tunnel with a spray of dissolving energy. Then, like a spider with a fly, pulled the smaller machine into the lair after him. He could have sliced the craft into a dozen sections, carved himself out a score of doors, sheared off the rocket jets, and so gain access. But he needed the ship intact. He waited. In a moment, a door opened, and a man appeared in it. He leaped lightly to the tunnel floor, and stood for a moment, peering against the glare of the searchlight of the other ship. With easy confidence, he walked closer, and it was then his eyes caught the gleam of the crystal in the dank, earthly wall of the cave. He glanced at it casually, then the very abnormality of a thing that could distract his attention even for a second penetrated his unconsciousness. With deliberate action, he plucked it out of the wall, and Cross's paralyzing ray sent him sprawling. Instantly, Cross clicked off all power. A switch closed, and the distant robot atomic wave broadcaster dissolved in the fire of its own energy. As for the man, all he wanted from him this time was a full-length photograph, 
a record of his voice and hypnotic control. And then it took only 20 minutes before Corliss was flying off again towards Samarium, inwardly raging against his enslavement, outwardly unable to do anything about it. There could be no hurrying of what Cross knew he must do before he could dare enter Samarium. Everything had to be anticipated, an almost unlimited amount of detail painstakingly worked out. Every fourth day, his holiday, Corliss called at the cave, going and coming, and as the urgent weeks flew, his mind drained of memory of detail. Finally, Cross was ready, and the next, the seventh holiday, his plan came to life. One Barton Corliss remained in the cave, deep in hypnotic sleep. The other one climbed into the small, red-striped craft and sped toward the city of Samarium. It was twenty minutes later that the battleship flashed down from the sky and loomed up beside him, a vast mass of streamlined metal ship. Corliss said a man's clipped voice in the ship's radio. In the course of normal observation of all slants resembling the snake jummy cross, we waited for you at this point and find that you are approximately five minutes overdue. You will accordingly proceed to Samarium under escort, where you will be taken before the military commission for examination. That is all. Chapter 15 Catastrophe came as simply as that. An accident not altogether unexpectable, but bitterly disappointing nonetheless. Six times before, Barton Corliss had been as much as twenty minutes overdue, and it had gone undetected. Now five minutes of equally unavoidable delay, and the long arm of chance had struck at the hope of a world. Gloomily, Cross stared into the busy plates as he mentally assayed his ravaged position. Below him was rock. Rock seemed gnarled and unutterably deserted. No longer were the ravines like small arroyos. They slashed this way and that, with the desperate incoherence of a wild beast at bay. Vast valleys snarled into life, gorges sheared off into depths, and then leaped up ferociously in ugly snags of mountain. This trackless waste was his way out, if ever he desired to escape, for no captured ship, however large and formidable, could hope to run the gauntlet that the tenderless slants could throw up between himself and his own indestructible machine. Some hope still remained, of course. He had an atomic revolver built to resemble Corliss's gun and which actually fired an electric charge until the secret mechanism for the atomic energy blast was activated and the wedding ring on his finger was as near a copy as he could make of the one that Corliss wore, the great difference being that it contained the smallest atomic generator ever constructed and was designed like the gun to dissolve if tampered with. Two weapons and a dozen crystals to stop the war of wars. Wilder now grew the land that fled beneath his prison ship. Black, placid water began to show in oily, dirty streaks at the bottom of those primeval abysses the beginning of the unclean, unbeautiful sea that was mere Samarium. Abruptly, there was unnatural life. On a table land of mountain to his right, a cruiser lay like a great, browsing black shark. A swarm of hundred-foot gunboats lay moveless on the rock around it, a wicked-looking school of deep space fish that partly hid the even deadlier reality of the land on which their hard bellies rested. Before his penetrating vision, the mountain became a design of steel and stone fortress. Black steel cleverly woven into black rock, gigantic guns peering into the sky. And there, to the left this time, was another tableland of steel and time-tempered rock, another cruiser and its complement of pilot ships, lying heavily in their almost invisible cradles, but ready to spring up with a weightless malignant power and a measurable threat now that his own machine was beyond his reach. The guns grew thicker, and always they pointed into the sky, as if waiting tensely for some momentarily expected and monstrously dangerous enemy. So much defence, so incredibly much defence, against what? Could these tenderless slands be so terrifically uncertain about the true slands that no totality of weapons could quench their fear of those mysteriously elusive beings? That must be why they had finally decided to attack, rather than wait a move from their unseen enemies. But even fear was no excuse for an attack on human beings, an attack that had behind it no sane policy of pacification, 
but only the force of unlimited oppression and crude terror. A hundred miles of impassable gorge, and water and frightful upjutting cliffs. And then, his ship and the great armoured vessel that was his escort soared over a spreading peak. And there, in the near distance, glittered the glass city of Samarium, and the hour of his examination was come. The city rode high on a plain that shrank back from the sheer falling ragged edge of a solid dark tongue of sea. The glass flashed in the sun, a burning white fire that darted over the surface in dazzling vivid bursts of flame. It was not a big city, compared to the thirty million of population, and eighty miles spread of the grand city of the palace, it was tiny, but it was as big as it could be in that forbidding area of land. It crowded with tight-fitting temerity to the very edge of the appalling gorges that ringed its glass roof. Its widest diameter was three miles. At its narrowest point, it sprawled a generous two miles, and in its confines dwelt 200,000 slams. The figures were according to Miller and Corliss. He saw the landing field, where he expected it would be, a flat field of metal at one projecting edge of the city. The field was big enough to take a battleship, and it was streaked with shining threads of railway. Lightly, his small machine settled toward one of the tracks onto metal cradle number 9977. Simultaneously, the great bulk of the warship above him surged off toward the sea and was instantly lost to sight as it passed the towering cliff edge of glasslight roof. Below him, the automatic machinery of the cradle rolled on its twin rails toward a great steel door. The door opened automatically and shut behind him. What his swift vision beheld in that first moment of entry was not unexpected, but the reality soared beyond the pictures of it that he had seen in the minds of Miller and Corliss. There must have been a thousand ships in the section of the vast hangar that he could see. From roof to ceiling they were parked in like sardines, each on its cradle, and each, he knew, capable of being called forth if the proper numbers were punched on the section instrument board. The machines stopped, Cross climbed casually down and nodded curtly to the three slans who waited there for him. The oldest looking of the three came forward, smiling faintly. Well, Barton, so you've earned another examination. You may be sure of a swift, thorough job. The usual, of course. Fingerprinting, x-ray, blood test, chemical reaction of the skin, microscope measurement of hair, and so on. There was a dark expectancy to the overtone of thought that leaked from the minds of the three men. But Cross did not need their thoughts. He had never been more alert, his brain never clearer, never more capable of distinguishing the subtlest exactness of details. He said mildly, since when has chemical reaction of the skin been a usual part of the examination? The men did not apologize for their little trap, nor did their thoughts show any disappointment at failure and Cross felt no thrill at this first small victory, for no triumph at this early stage could hide the desperate truth that he could not possibly stand a thorough examination. He must use to the limit the preparations he had made these last several weeks when he had analysed the information from Miller's and Corliss's mind. He must have time, or he was finished before he could start. The youngest man said, Bring him into the laboratory and we'll get the physical part of his examination over. Take his gun, Prentice. Cross handed over the weapon without a word. They waited then, the oldest man, Ingram, smiling expectantly. Bradshaw, the youngest, stared at him with unwinking grey eyes. Prentice alone looked indifferent as he pocketed Cross's gun. But it was the silence, not their actions, that caught Cross's mind. There was not a physical sound, nowhere even a whisper of conversation. The whole community of the hangar was like a graveyard, and for the moment it seemed impossible that beyond those walls a city hummed with activity in preparation for a monstrous war. He actuated the combination and watched his cradle and ship slide off soundlessly, first horizontally, then up toward the remote ceiling. There was abruptly the faintest squealing of metal, and then it settled into position, and silence grew over the brief protrusion of sound. Smiling inwardly at the way they were watching him for the slightest error of procedure, Cross led the way to the exit. It opened onto a shining corridor, the smooth walls of which were spaced at intervals with closed doors. When they were within sight of entrance to the laboratory, Cross said, 
I suppose you called the hospital in time, telling them I would be delayed. Ingram stopped short, and the others followed suit. They stared at him. Ingram said, Good heaven, is your wife being revived this morning? Unsmiling, Cross nodded. The doctors were to have her on the verge of consciousness 20 minutes after I was due to land. At that time, they will have been working for approximately an hour. Your examination and that of the military commission will obviously have to be postponed. There was no disagreement. Ingram said, The military will escort you, no doubt. It was Bradshaw who spoke briefly into his wrist radio. The tiny yet clear answer reached across. The speaker said, Under ordinary circumstances, the military patrol would escort him to the hospital. But it happens that we are confronted by the most dangerous individual the world has ever known. Cross is only 26, but it is a proven fact that danger and adversity matures men and slans at an early age. We can assume then that we are dealing with a full-grown true slan possessed of weapons and powers beyond compare. If Corliss should actually be Cross, then the coincidence of Mrs. Corliss's return to consciousness at this important hour betokens preparation for all possible contingencies, particularly of suspicion at the moment of landing. He has already suffered a major defeat in that there is going to be an examination, the final determining portion of it, by people other than those who now accompany him. Nevertheless, the very fact that postponement has been necessitated for the first time in our examination of men resembling cross requires that experts trained to preliminary examinations be with him every second of the time. You will, therefore, carry on until further orders. A surface car is waiting at the head of elevator number one. As they emerged into the street, Bradshaw said, If he is not Corliss, then he will be absolutely useless at the hospital, and Mrs. Corliss's mind will possibly be permanently injured. Ingram shook his head. You're mistaken. True slans can read minds. He'll be able to do as good a job of sensing errors of the surgical room as Corliss with the aid of the poor grave receivers. Cross caught the grim smile on Bradshaw's face as the slan said softly, your voice trailed off there, Ingram. Did it suddenly occur to you that the presence of the poor graves will prevent Cross from using his mind except in the most limited way? Another thing, it was Prentice who spoke. The reason for Corliss going to the hospital at all is that he will recognize when something is wrong because of the psychological affinity that develops over a period of years between a husband and wife. But that also means that Mrs. Corliss will recognize instantly whether or not he is her husband. Ingram was smiling grimly. We have then the final conclusion. If Corliss is cross, the revival of Mrs. Corliss in his presence may have tragic results for her. Those very results will go far to prove his identity, even if all other tests we make turn out negatively. Cross said nothing. He had made a very thorough examination of the problem presented by the poor grave receivers. They constituted unmistakable danger, but they were only machines. Absolute care together with his superlative control over his mind should reduce that constant menace. Recognition by Mrs. Corliss was another matter. Affinity between a sensitive husband and his sensitive wife was easily understandable, and it was unthinkable that he should contribute to the destruction of this slant woman's mind. Somehow he must save her sanity, but, quite clearly, he saw that the danger was enormous, and worse still, it was immediate. The car sped smoothly along a boulevard that glowed with flowers. The road was dark, glassy in appearance, and not straight. It wound in and out among the tall spreading trees that half hid the buildings that lined the far sides of the shaded walks to the left and right. The buildings were low-built structures, and their beauty, the flowing artistry of their design, brought him genuine surprise. He had captured something of the picture they made from the minds of Miller and Corliss, but this sheer triumph of architectural genius was beyond his anticipation. A fortress was not expected to be beautiful. Gun turrets were ordinarily built for usefulness rather than to serve as poems of architecture. As it was, they served their purpose admirably. They looked like actual buildings, part of an actual city, instead of being merely a thick armoured screen for the true city below. Once again, the vastness of the defence forces showed with what respect the true slans were viewed. A world of men was going to be attacked because of the tendrilless slan fear, and that was the ultimate and fantastic tragic irony. 
If I'm right, Cross thought, and the true slans are actually living in with the tenderless slans, as the tenderless slans in their turn live with the human beings, then all this preparation is against an enemy that has already slipped inside the defences. The car stopped in an alcove that led to an elevator. The elevator dropped as swiftly into the depths as the first elevator had come up out of the hangar. Casually, Cross took one of the metal crystal cubes out of his pocket and tossed it into the waste paper receptacle that fitted snugly into one corner of the cage. He saw that the slans had followed his action. He explained, Got a dozen of those things, but apparently eleven is all I can comfortably carry. The weight of the others kept pressing that one against my side. It was Ingram who stooped and picked up the deadly little thing. What is it? The reason for my delay. I'll explain to the commissioner later. The twelve are all exactly the same, so that one won't matter. Ingram stared at it thoughtfully and was just about to open it when the elevator stopped. He put it decisively in his pocket. I'll keep this, he said. You go out first, Corliss. Without hesitation, Cross stepped into the broad marble corridor. A fine-looking woman in a white cloak came forward. You will be called in a few minutes, Barton. Wait here. She vanished into a doorway, and Cross walked slowly across the width of the stately corridor to a glass window, stared through into the room beyond. Gradually, his muscles grew tense, his nerves taut. With uttermost fascination, he gazed at an entire room full of monstrosities. Dead babies lay on tables, row on row of them, stretching in even lines away from the glass through which Cross stared. The nearest of that gruesome line was human in shape, but it had three legs. Small golden slam tendrils lay flat on its head. Two semi-human arms emerged from its shoulders, tapering off into boneless tentacles. Its eyes were lidless, and the glazed eyeballs that stared sightlessly up at him had no color, unlike a normal human baby, whose eyes at birth are invariably blue. Cross's mind became very still as he gazed at the thing. It was not human and not slam. But he knew the answer. Horribly, it had tried to be a slam. Somewhere in the months before it was born or conceived, a true slam had turned a slam controlling machine on its mother. In all the years since he had first heard of these creatures, here was his first sight of them. Here, the reality behind all the devilish accusations that he had, in his childhood, denied so passionately and branded as the vilest lies. Genuine intellectual horror coursed through him. Here were some of the dreadful failures of slan attempts to make more slans. No wonder there were attempts at slan extermination. What manner of distorted mentality could go on committing such atrocities, prepared to accept such a criminally high percentage of failure? He thought, was he a fool to keep searching for beings capable of such scoundrelism, to think of aligning himself with them? Everywhere he turned, the material evidence against them piled higher and higher. Before such silent witnesses as these babies, his theory seemed shabbier every minute. Here was nothing but evil and danger. Danger. He grew aware of a surface thought from Ingram. He turned as the older Slan said, This business of Mrs. Corliss worries me so much that I feel before we allow you in there, Corliss, we ought to make a simple test that we haven't used for years because of his lack of dignity and because of other equally effective tests. What's the test? Cross asked curtly. Well, if you're Cross, you'll be wearing false hair to cover your slam tendrils. If you're Corliss, the natural strength of your hair would enable us to lift you right off the ground, and you'd scarcely feel it. False hair, artificially fastened on, could not possibly stand pressure. So for the sake of your wife, I'm going to ask you to bend your head. We'll be gentle and apply the pressure gradually. Cross smiled gently. Go ahead. I think you'll find it as genuine hair. It was, of course. Long since, he had discovered a kind of answer to that dangerous problem. A thick fluid that worked over the roots of his hair gradually hardened into a thin layer of rubbery, flesh-looking stuff sufficient to cover his betraying tendrils. By carefully twisting the hair just before the hardening process was completed, tiny air holes were formed through to the hair roots. Frequent removal of the material and long periods of leaving his hair and head in the natural state had in the past proved sufficient to keep the health of the top of his head unimpaired. Something similar, it seemed to him, 
was what the true Slavs must have been doing these many years. The danger lay in the periods of rest. Ingram said finally, grudgingly, It doesn't really prove anything. If Cross ever came here, he wouldn't be caught on anything as simple as that. Here's the doctor, and I guess it's okay. The bedroom was large and grey and full of machines, softly pulsing machines. The patient was not visible, but there was a long metal case like a streamlined coffin, one end of which pointed toward the door. The other end Cross couldn't see, but he knew the woman's head was projecting from that far side. Attached to the top of the case was a long, bulging, transparent test tube affair. Pipes ran from it down into the coffin, and through these pipes, through that bulbous bottle, flowed a rich, steady stream of red blood. A solid bank of instruments sat almost stolidly just beyond the woman's protruding head. Lights were there, glowing with the faintest unsteadiness, as if now one, now another, was yielding obstinately to some hidden pressure. Each time the one affected fought stubbornly to regain the infinitesimal loss of brightness. From where the doctor made him stop, Cross could see the woman's head against the background of those whispering machines. No, not her head. Only the bandages that completely swathed her head were visible, and it was into the white pulp of bandage that the host of wires from the instrument board disappeared. Her mind was unshielded, a still broken thing, and it was into the region of semi-thoughts that flowed along in dead slow time that Cross probed cautiously. He knew the theory of what the tendril of slant surgeons had done. The body was entirely disconnected from nervous contact with the brain by a simple system of short circuit. The brain itself, kept alive by rapid tissue building rays, had been divided into 27 distinct sections, and thus simplified, the enormous amount of repair work had been swiftly performed. His thought waves sped past those operation breaks and mends. There were faults in plenty, he saw, but all of a distinctly minor character, so superbly had the surgical work been done. Every section of that powerful brain would yield to the healing force of the medical light, which was what tissue-building rays were called. Beyond doubt, Mrs. Corliss would open her eyes as seeing, enormously capable young woman and recognise him for the impostor he was. Icily detached in spite of urgency, Cross thought, I was able to hypnotise human beings without crystals years ago, though it took a great deal longer. Why not slams? She was unconscious and her shield was down. At first he was too aware of the poor grave receivers and the immense danger they offered and then he grooved his mind to the anxiety vibration that would be normal for Corliss and hanged the consequences. All fear drained from his brain. He strained forward with frantic speed. It was the method of the operation that saved him. A properly knit slant brain would have required hours, so many millions of paths to explore without a clue to a proper beginning. But now, in this divided brain, it was different. A mind split by master surgeons into his 27 natural compartments, and one of them was the mass of cells comprising the willpower. In one minute he was at the control centre, and the palpable force of his thought waves had made her his slave. He had time then to place the earphones of the poor grave receivers over his head, noting at the same time that Bradshaw already had on a pair. For him, he thought grimly. But there was no suspicion at the surface of the dark-haired young man's mind. Evidently, thought in the form of an almost pure physical force, completely pictureless, could not be translated by the poor graves. His own tests were confirmed. The woman stirred mentally and physically, and the vague incoherent thought in her mind clattered as a sound in his earphones. Fight. Occupation. The words fitted only because she had been a military commander, but there was not enough to make sense. Silence, then. June, definitely June. Be able to clear up before winter, then, and have no unnecessary deaths from cold and dislocation. That's settled, then. June 10th. He could have repaired the faults in her brain in ten minutes by hypnotic suggestion, but it took an hour and a quarter of cautious cooperation with the surgeons and their vibration pressure machine, and every minute of the time he was thinking about her words. So June 10th was the day of the attack on Earth. This was April 4th, Earth Reckoning. Two months. A month for the journey to Earth. And a month for what? As Mrs. Corliss slipped quietly into a dreamless sleep, 
Cross had the answer, the tremendous answer. Impossible to waste another day searching for the true slams, especially now that they loomed larger than ever as supreme villains. Later, perhaps, that trail could be picked up again, but now, if he could get out of this damn mess. He frowned mentally. What the hell was he making plans for? Within minutes, he would be under physical examination by members of the most ruthless, most thoroughgoing and efficient race in the solar system. In spite of his successful attempt at delay, in spite of his preliminary success in getting a crystal into the hands of one of his escort, luck had been against him. Ingram was not curious enough to take the crystal out of his pocket and open it. He'd have to make another attempt, of course, but that was desperation. No slam would be anything but suspicious at such a second try, no matter how the approach was made. He... His thoughts stopped, his sensitive mind still to a perfect state of reception, as an almost inaudible voice spoke from Ingram's radio, and the words flowed across the surface of Ingram's mind. Physical examination completed or not, you will bring Barton Corliss immediately before me. That supersedes any previous order. Okay, Joanna, Ingram replied quite audibly. He turned. You have to be taken at once before Joanna Hillary, the military commissioner. It was Prentice who echoed the hard thought in Cross's mind. The tall slant said, Joanna is the only one of us who spent hours with Cross and she was appointed commissioner with that experience and her subsequent studies in mind. She supervised the worldwide successful search for you, and she also predicted the failure of the attack that was made with the cyclotron. In addition, she has written four books outlining in minutest details the hours she has spent in your company. If you're Cross, she'll recognize you in one minute flat. I've read the books, said Cross quietly. It was true, and he had known after the first volume that under no voluntary circumstances must he come under the calm scrutiny of that able and terrible young woman. As Cross emerged from the case room, he had his first glimpse of the city of Samarium, the true underground city. From the doorway he could see along two corridors, one led back to the elevator down which he had come, the other to a broad expanse of tall transparent doors. Beyond the doors lay a city of dreams. It had been said on earth that the secret materials that made up the walls of the Grand Palace had been lost. But it wasn't, for here in this hidden city of the tenderless slans was all the glory of it, and more. There was a street of swift changing colours, and the magnificent realisation of that age-old dream of architects, form-perfect buildings that were alive as music was alive. Here was and no other word could apply because no word in his knowledge was suitable. Here was the gorgeous equivalent in architecture of the highest form of music, polyphonic as distinct from symphonic. Out in the street, he cut the unearthly beauty of it from his mind. Only the people mattered, and there were thousands in the buildings, in bustling cars and on foot. Thousands of minds within reach of a mind that missed nothing, and searched now with a desperate intensity for one. Just one true slam. And there was none, not a trace of betraying mind whisper, not a brain that did not know its owner was a tenderless slam. Definitely, finally, the leaky brain shields gave of their knowledge. His conviction that they must be here was shattered, as his life would now be. Wherever the true slams were, their protection was slam proof, beyond logic. But then, of course, logic had said that monster babies were not created by decent folk. The facts, it happened, were otherwise. What facts? Hearsay? But what other explanation was there? Here we are, Ingram said quietly. Inside the fine, long, low building, a few men and women moved in and out among row on row of great, thick, shiny, metallic plates. This cross knew was the Bureau of Statistics, and these plates were the electric filing cabinets that yielded their information at the touch of a button the spelling out of a name, a number, a key word. No one knew, so Corliss's mind had informed him, how much information was in those cabinets. They had been brought from Earth and dated back to the earliest slam days. A quadrillion facts were there for the asking. Included, no doubt, was the entire story of the seven-year search for one John Thomas Cross, the search that Joanna Hillary had directed from the inner sanctum of this very building. But that last didn't matter now. There was a great truth to be discovered, 
a cross-reference that perhaps had never occurred to anyone else in this world of tenderless slam. Ingram was saying, She'll have us in in a minute or so. Cross asked, Do you mind if I ask a few questions from the sticks? Ingram shrugged. Might as well while you're here. No one followed Cross. No one interfered with him. He stood very still for a moment, recollecting exactly what he had seen in Corliss's mind about the operation of this machine. Swiftly then, he punched Samuel Lan, followed by Natural Mutation. He touched the activating button and read on a glowing plate. Excerpts from Samuel Lan's diary, June 1, 1971, to December 15, 2056. Today, I had another look at the three babies, and of course there is no doubt that there is an extraordinary mutation. I have seen human beings with tails. I have examined cretins and idiots, and observed these curious, dreadful organic developments that human beings are subject to. But this is the opposite of such horrors. This is perfection. Two girls and a boy. What a grand and tremendous accident. If I were not a cold-blooded rationalist, the exact rightness of what has happened would make me a babbling worshipper at the shrine of metaphysics. Two girls to reproduce their kind and one boy to mate with them. I'll have to train them to the idea. Two girls and a boy. Oh, cosmic coincidence that such a birth should have happened to a scientist. It couldn't have happened better if I had planned it myself. June 2nd, 1971 began the machine, but Cross pressed urgently at the dissolver, manipulated the number key, and produced June 7, 1973, followed by Same damn fool journalist wrote an article about the children today. The ignoramus stated that I had used a machine on my wife. Where the devil did he hear about them at all? I'll have to retreat to some remote, uninhabited part of the world. Anything could happen where there are human beings, superstitious, emotional asses. Thank heaven, the present-day human being is on his last lap. An end to stupidity and eternal wars and black lies. Hurriedly, Cross punched at random. May 31, 1988. Their 17th birthday. The girls thoroughly accept the idea of mating with their brother. Morality, after all, is a matter of training. I live in panic lest a meteorite fall and snuff us all out, or some other cataclysm destroy these precious lives. It was August 18, 1990 that produced Each of the girls had triplets. Wonderful. At this rate of reproduction, the period when chance can destroy them will soon be reduced to an actuarial minimum. The children are fully alive now to the importance of their lives and that their descendants are the future rulers of the earth. I must see to it that the children of one marry only the children of the other. We must get away from inbreeding as soon as possible. From behind him, Bradshaw called. Come along, Corliss. Miss Hillary will see you now, alone. The floor felt strangely hard beneath his feet as he walked a hundred feet to the open door. Sardonicism was almost a physical weight on his mind. Eight hundred years of hell and death, perhaps more of the nameless, Timeless period that followed the war of disaster was as long as some estimated. And now, a part of the simple truth rediscovered by a man on his way to death. There was not, never had been, a slam making machine. All slams were purely natural mutations. The inner sanctum of the chief of statistics was large and cosy, and it looked like a private den rather than a business office. There were books on shelves, against one wall was a similar version of the electric filing cabinets outside. There was a soft-toned Chesterfield, and multi-pneumatic chairs, and a rug. And finally, there was a great gleaming desk behind which sat a proud, smiling, youthful woman. Cross had not expected Joanna Hillary to look older, and she didn't. Another fifty years might put lines into those velvet-smooth cheeks, but now there was only one difference, and that was in himself. Eleven years before, a boy slan had gazed at this glorious woman. Now his eyes held the cool appraisal of maturity. He noted curiously that her gaze was eager bright, and that seemed out of place. His mind concentrated. The coordinated power of his senses abruptly dissolved her facial expression into triumph and a deep, genuine joy. 
Alertly, his brain pressed against her mind shield, probing at the tiny gaps, absorbing every leak of thought, analyzing every overtone, and second by second his puzzlement grew. Her smile flashed into soft laughter, and then, just like that, her shield went down. Her mind lay before him, exposed to his free, untrammeled gaze. Simultaneously, a thought formed in her brain. Look deep, John Thomas Cross, and know first that all poor grave receivers in this room and vicinity have been disconnected. Know, too, that I am your only living friend, and that I ordered you brought before me to forestall a physical examination which you could not possibly survive. I watched you through the poor graves, and finally I knew it was you. But hurry, search in my mind, verify my good will, and then we must act swiftly to save your life. There was no credulity, no trustfulness in his chilled, logical brain. The moments fled, and still he probed the dark corridors of her brain, searching for those basic reasons that alone could explain this wondrous thing. At last he said quietly, So you believed in the ideals of a fifteen-year-old, caught fire from a young egoist who offered only... Hope, she finished. You brought hope just before I reached the point where most slans became as hard and ruthless as life in a hate-filled world can make them. Human beings, you said. What about human beings? and the shock of that and other things affected me beyond recovery. I deliberately gave a false description of you. You may have wondered about that. I passed it off because I was not supposed to have an expert's knowledge of human physiology. I didn't, of course, but I could have drawn you perfectly from memory, and the picture grew clearer every day. It was considered natural that I become a student of the Cross Affair, and natural, too, that I was appointed to most of the supervisory positions that had any connection with you. I suppose it was equally natural that. She stopped almost expectantly, and Cross said gravely, I'm sorry about that. Her grey eyes met his brown ones steadily. Whom else will you marry, she asked. A normal life must include marriage. Of course, I know nothing of your relationship to the slam girl Kathleen Layton. But marriage to several women, frequently at the same time, is not unusual in slan history. Then, of course, there is my age. I recognize, Cross said simply, that fifteen or twenty years is not the slightest obstacle to marriage among long-lived slans. It happens, however, that I have a mission. Whether as wife or not, said Joanna Hillary, from this hour you have a companion on that mission, provided we can get you through this physical examination alive. Oh, that. Cross waved one smooth, powerful hand. All I needed was time and a method of getting certain crystals into the hands of Ingram and the others. You have provided both. We'll also need the paralyzer gas in the drawer of your desk, and then call them in one at a time. With one sweeping movement of her hand, she drew the gun from the drawer. I'll do the shooting, she said. Now what? Cross laughed softly at Joanna Hillary's vehemence and felt a strange wonder at the turn of events, even now that he was sure. For years he had lived on nerve and cold determination. Abruptly, something of her fire touched him. His eyes gleamed. And you shall not regret what you have done, though your faith may be tried to the utmost before we are finished. This attack on earth must not take place. Not now. Not until we know what to do with those poor devils aside from holding them down by force. Tell me, is there any way I can get to Earth? I read in Corliss's mind something about a plan to transfer to Earth all slans resembling me. Can that be done? It can. The decision rests entirely with me. Then, said Cross grimly, the time has come for swift action. I must get to Earth. I must go to the palace. I must see Keir Grey. The perfect mouth parted in a smile, but there was no humour in those fine, brave eyes. And how, she said softly, are you going to get near the palace with its fortifications? My mother spoke often of the secret passages under the palace, Cross answered. Perhaps the Styx machine will know the exact location of the various entrances. It knows, Joanna Hillary said gravely, and so do I. The best entrance for your purpose is located in the statuary section, two miles inside the grounds, constantly under brilliant lights and directly under the guns of the first line of heavy fortifications. Also, machine gun emplacements and tank patrols control the first two miles. What about my gun? 
Would I be allowed to have it on earth? No, the plan of transferring the men resembling you includes their disarmament. He was aware of her questioning gaze on him and his lean, strong face twisted into a frown. What kind of a man is Keir Gray, according to your records? Enormously capable for a human being. Our secret x-rays definitely show him as human, if that's what you're thinking. At one time I did think about that, but your words verify Kathleen Layton's experience. We've got off the track, Joanna Hillary said. What about the fortifications? He shook his head, smiling humorlessly. When the stakes are great, risks must match them. Naturally, I shall go alone. You, he gazed at her darkly, will have the great trust of locating the cave where my ship is and getting the machine through to Earth before June 10th. Corliss, too, will have to be released. And now, please call Ingram in. Chapter 16 The river seemed wider than when Cross had last seen it. A cold, turgid quarter mile of swirling May waters that glinted and shone in twitching, twisting patches of darkness and light in endless reflection from the incessant, changing wonder fire of the palace. There was late spring snow in the concealing brush where he removed his clothes, and it tingled coldly against his bare feet when he stood at last, stripped for his grueling task. He held his mind on the verge of thoughtlessness. Only the thin realization came that one naked man against the world was a sorry tribute to the almost illimitable power of atomic energy. So many weapons he had had, and not used them when he could, and now this ring on his finger with its tiny atomic generator and his pitiful two-foot effective range, this was the end product of all his years of effort. The sky was overcast, and the trees from the opposite bank made swirling shadows half across the river. The darkness streaked the ugly swell of racing water that carried him half a mile downstream, before his long backstrokes finally brought him to the shelter of the shallows. He lay there, his mind reconnoitering the blare of thought that came from the two machine gunners hidden in the trees. Cautiously, he edged into a patch of concealing brush, donned his clothes, and lay patient as an old tiger stalking his prey. There was a clearing to be crossed, and it was too far for hypnotic control. The moment of their carelessness came abruptly, and he covered the fifty yards in a fraction over three seconds. One man never knew what struck him. The other jerked around spasmodically, his long, thin face strained and ghastly in the flicker of light that peered through the foliage. But there was no stopping, no evading the blow that caught his jaw and smashed him to the ground. In fifteen minutes of chrysalis hypnotism, they were under control. Fifteen minutes. Eight an hour. He smiled ironically. That certainly precluded any possibility of hypnotically overpowering the palace with its ten thousand or so men. What he must have was key men. He brought the two men back to consciousness and gave them his orders. Silently, they took their portable machine guns and fell in behind him. They knew every inch of the ground. They knew when the tank patrols rolled by on their ceaseless night rounds. There were no better soldiers in the human army than the palace guards, and in two hours there were a dozen trained fighters slipping along like shadows, working in a silent swift coordination that needed only an occasional soft-spoken command. In three more hours, he had altogether seventeen men, a colonel, a captain, and three lieutenants. And ahead was the long cordon of exquisite statuary, sparkling fountains and blazing lights, that marked at once his goal and the end of the first simple operation. The first hint of the coming dawn misted the eastern sky, as Cross lay with his little army in the shadows of shrubbery and stared across the quarter mile of brilliantly lighted area. He could see the dark line of woods on the other side, where the fortifications were hidden. Unfortunately, the colonel whispered, there is no chance of tricking them. The jurisdiction of this unit ends right here. It is forbidden to cross to any one of the dozen fortified rings without a pass, and even a pass can be used only in the daytime. Cross frowned. There were precautions here beyond his greatest expectations, and he saw that their strictness was of recent enactment. The slant attack on his valley, though no one believed the wild peasant talks about the size of the ships involved nor suspected they were spaceships, had produced a nervous tension, a flaming alertness that might defeat him now. Captain, 
Yes, the tall officer slid up beside him. Captain, you look the most like me. You will therefore exchange your uniform for my clothes, and then you, all of you, will return to your regular stations. He watched them slip off, vanish. Then he stood up with the stiff carriage of the captain and stalked out into the light. Ten feet, twenty, thirty. He could see the fountain he wanted, a great glittering shape with its sparkling streams of water. But there was too much artificial light, too many minds around, a confusion of vibrations that must be interfering with the one thought wave his mind was reaching for. If the damn thing was still there, after all these hundreds of years, if it wasn't there, God help him. Forty feet, fifty, sixty, and then to his tense, desperate brain came a whisper. The tiniest of tiny mind vibrations, so weak as to be but a veriest caress. To any slant who penetrate this far, there is a secret passage into the palace. The five-flower design on the white fountain due north is a combination knob that operates on the secret door by radio. The combination is, he had known, the sticks machine had known, that the secret was in the fountain, but no more than that. Now, a harsh, magnified voice smashed out from the far trees. Who the devil are you? What do you want? Get back to your commanding officer, obtain a pass, and return in the morning. Quick. He was at the fountain, his swift fingers on the flower design. His body and action half hidden from the host of staring, suspicious eyes, and there was not an ounce of energy to spare from his intense concentration. Before that singleness of purpose, the combination yielded, and a second thought came from a second poor grave broadcaster. The door is now open. It is an extremely narrow tunnel leading down through dense darkness. The mouth is in the centre of the equestrian group of statuary a hundred feet due north. Have courage. It was not courage that was lacking, it was time. A hundred feet north toward the palace, toward those menacing forts. Cross laughed curtly. The ancient builder of the secret entrance had certainly picked a hell of a spot to practice his ingenuity. He walked on, even as the harsh voice lashed out again. You out there, you will stop at once or we fire. Return to your district and consider yourself under arrest. At once. I've got a very important message. Cross called in a clear voice that was as similar to the captain's as he could make it without practice. Emergency. And still they didn't actually consider one man dangerous. Still he walked on. The answer blared back. No possible emergency justifies such a flagrant breach of regulations. Return immediately to your district. I warn you for the last time. He stared down at the little black hole and a sharp dismay struck into him like a knife. A piercing claustrophobia. The first he had ever known, black and terrible as the tunnel itself entrust himself to that rabbit's burrow with its potentialities of suffocation to be possibly buried alive in some cunningly contrived human trap. There could be no certainty that they had not discovered this as they had already discovered so many other slan hideaways. Abruptly, it was urgent. A torrent of sibilant pulsations reached out of the trees ahead, little menacing whispers that breathed against his brain like soft physical things. Somebody saying, Sergeant, train your gun on him. What about the horse grip, sir? Be a bloody shame to nick them. Aim at his legs and then his head. And that was that. With clenched teeth, body stiff and straight, and arms flung over his head, he leaped like a diver going feet first and came down so perfectly in the tunnel that it was several seconds before his clothes scraped the vertical walls. The passage was as smooth as glass, and it was only after Cross had fallen an immense distance that it started to tilt away from the vertical. Pressure of friction grew stronger, and after more swift seconds, he was sliding along at a distinct angle that grew flatter by the instant. His breathless speed slowed measurably. He saw a glimmer of light ahead. Abruptly, he emerged into a low-roofed, dimly lighted corridor. His line of motion was still slightly downward, but it straightened rapidly. His journey ended, he lay dizzily on his back for a moment, his vision spinning madly. A dozen revolving lights above him gradually tightened their circle and became a single, dim bulb shedding a dull refulgence around it. A wan, almost futile light hugged the ceiling and melted into darkness before it reached the floor. 
Cross climbed to his feet and found himself staring at a sign that was just high enough up on the wall for the ceiling light to touch it. He strained and read, You are now two miles below the surface. The tunnel behind you is blocked by steel and concrete shafts, which were actuated each in its turn for your passage. It will take several hours to get from here to the palace. Slans, not on official business, are forbidden from entering the palace. Take heed. There was a tickling in his throat. He fought back the sneeze, but it came followed by a half a dozen more. The tears ran down his cheeks. It was dimmer where he stood than when he had first come into the corridor. The long row of ceiling lights that faded into the remote distance ahead were not as bright as they had been. Dust obscured them. Cross bent in the half-darkness and ran his finger lightly over the floor. A soft, thick carpet of dust lay there. He peered ahead, searching for footprints that would show that this corridor had been recently used. But there was only the dust, an inch at least, years of it. Countless years since that order, with its vague but once potent threat, had been placed here. Meanwhile, there was more real danger. Human beings would now know where to look for the secret entrance. Before they discovered it, he must, in the defiance of the Slan law, penetrate the palace and get at Keir Grey. It was a world of shadows and silence, and insidious choking fingers of dust that kept ever reaching for Cross's throat. And then, ludicrous paradox, tickled instead of strangled. There were doors and corridors and great stately rooms like long-abandoned funeral homes, like the temple of the dead-lost Chur folk that stood through all eternity in the shadows of Mount Gog in the upper Simona's Valley. And then abruptly, there was another sign which read, Warning, this passageway leads to the secret elevator into the study of Keir Grey. Under no circumstances must any slan enter this man's apartment. The slan government has invoked penalty number 26 for such infringement. Section 26 of the Criminal Code states, the punishment shall be removal by surgery of the slam tendrils. Take heed. All around was dust. It coated the walls, clung gently to the sign itself. It lay intact, untouched, virgin on the floor ahead. But no layer on layer of dust could conceal the enormous menace of that warning. The very mention of Keir Gray proved that it had been placed there since the dictator's accession to power as a young man, less than 35 years before. Slan councils, removal by surgery of slan tendrils. Here then were the true slans, true slans who removed tendrils, which made them similar to their tendrilous cousins, which meant they could penetrate into cities like Samarium, but they hadn't. The law of averages alone would have enabled him to find at least one true slan if they had been infiltrated through the tendrilous slan world. That left him where? The first burning excitement passed. His mind grew cold, and he walked on thoughtfully. After all, he still must see Keir Grey. As for threats, let any slam, true or otherwise, threaten the master of atomic energy and hypnotism, particularly the true slams who had let matters get into an unholy mess, by first scaring the tenderless ones for hundreds of years, and then, having forced them into monstrous armament, standing by helplessly, while those armaments conquered a world. A soft metallic click behind him whipped Cross out of his reverie. He whirled and saw that a solid sheet of metal door had flowed softly into the floor over which he had just passed, creating a smooth, hard wall. He stood very still, and for a moment he was a sensitive machine receiving impressions. There was the long, narrow corridor ending just ahead, the dim lights above and the floor beneath him, the ladder cushioned by a thick, yielding dust. Into the silence, a second click projected harshly. The walls creaked metallically and began to move, coming at a deliberate pace toward him and toward each other. Automatic, he decided, for there was not the faintest tendril of thought anywhere. Coolly, he examined the potentialities of the trap and presently discovered at the extreme end of each wall a nook. Each nook was six feet, four inches in height a shallow space large enough to hold half a human body sideways. Even the contours of the body were grooved into those nooks. There was the curve for the shoulders to fit into, and a narrow space for the arm and hand. Cross smiled grimly. In a few minutes, the walls would close together, and the only available space for him would be where the two nooks would then be joined. A neat trap. 
True, the atomic energy of the ring on his finger could probably disintegrate a pathway for him through the walls or the door, but his logic demanded that this trap be successful, up to a point. He examined the nooks more carefully. This time his ring flashed twice in brief fury, dissolving the handcuffs that waited in the handholds for the helpless, carving also enough space to give him freedom of movement. When the walls were a foot apart, an inch-wide crack opened the full length of the floor, and the small mountain of dust poured into it. Half a minute later, the two walls met with a metallic bang. A moment of silence, then machinery whirred faintly, and there was a swift flow of upward movement. The movement continued for minutes on end. It slowed finally and stopped, but the machinery still whispered beneath him. Another minute, and then the cubicle in which he stood began to revolve slowly. A crack appeared before his face, a crack that widened into a rectangular hole through which he could see into a room. The machinery stopped whirring. There was silence again, while Cross examined the room with swift, flashing gaze. There was a desk in the centre of the highly polished floor, and walnut-panelled walls beyond, some chairs and filing cabinets, and the edge of a floor-to-ceiling bookcase completed what he could see of the spare, business-like room. Footsteps sounded. The man who came in and shut the door behind him was a magnificently built creature great at the temples now, lines of age showing. But there was no one in the world who would not have recognised that lean, dark, powerful face, those piercing eyes, the sheer, smashing, heedless ruthlessness that was written indelibly in those thin nostrils, that lean line of jaw. It was a face too hard, too determined to be pleasant. But withal, it was a noble countenance. Here was a born leader of men. Cross felt himself dissected, his face explored by those keen eyes. Finally, the proud mouth twisted into the faintest sneer. Here Gray said, So you got caught in spite of the warnings. It was the words that did it, for with them came surface thoughts, and those surface thoughts were a deliberate screen held over a mind shield as tight as his own. No leaky tendril of slant shield this, but an enormous fact. Keir Gray, leader of men, was a true slam. That one explosive sentence Cross uttered, and then the fluidity of his mind chilled into an ice of quiet thought. All those years that Kathleen Leighton had lived with Keir Gray and not suspected the truth. Of course, she had lacked experience with mind shields, and there had been John Petty with the same type of shield to confuse the issue, because John Petty was human. How cleverly the dictator had imitated the human way of thought protection. Cross shook himself mentally, and determined to get reaction this time, repeated, So you're a true slam. The other's dark face twisted sardonically. What did you expect? For hundreds of years, we who knew the truth have existed for one purpose, to prevent the tenderless slams from taking over the world of men. What more natural than that we should insinuate our way to control of the human government? Are we not the most intelligent beings on the face of the earth? Cross nodded. It fitted, of course. His own deductions had told him that. Once he knew that the true slans were not actually the hidden government of the tenderless slans, it was inevitable they would be governing the human world. For all Kathleen's beliefs and the tenderless slan X-ray pictures showing Keir Gray to be possessed of a human heart and other non-slan organs, somewhere here was still tremendous mystery. He shook his head finally. I still don't get it all. I expected to find the true slan ruling the tendrilus secretly. Everything fits, of course, in a distorted fashion. But why anti-slan propaganda? What about that slan ship which came to the palace eleven years ago? Why are true slans hunted and killed like rats? Why not an arrangement with the tendrilus slans? The leader stared at him coldly. We have tried on occasion to tamper with the anti-slam propaganda, one such attempt being that very ship to which you have referred. For special reasons, I was forced to order it down in the marshes, but in spite of that apparent failure, it succeeded in its main purpose, which was to convince the tenderless slans who were definitely contemplating their attack that we were still a force to be reckoned with. It was the palpable weakness of the silver ship that convinced the tenderless slans. They knew we could not be that impotent, and so, once more, they hesitated and were lost. 
It has always been unfortunate the number of true slans being killed in various parts of the world. They are the descendants of slans who scattered after the war of disaster, never made connection with the slan organization. After the tendril of slans came on the scene, it was, of course, too late to do anything. Our enemies were in a position to interfere with every communication device that we possessed. We tried our best, naturally, to contact such wanderers, but the only ones who really got through were those who came to the palace to kill me. For them, we provided a number of easy passageways into the palace. My instruments tell me that you came the hard way, through one of the ancient entrances, very daring. We can use another bold young man in our organization. Though why you came on, knowing true slans ruled here, after warnings, he finished curtly. However, everything will be explained to you later. I shall now actuate the machinery that will transport your cubicle to the lower tunnels where in due course a slam will arrive to remove your tendrils, after which you will be released. This is in accordance with the law forbidding slams to enter my rooms. Cross stared at the other coolly. Keir Gray obviously did not suspect his identity, nor did he know how desperately near was the hour of tendril to slam attack. It made the moment a great one, as he said, Unfortunately, I have no intention of doing without my tendrils. In this case, at least, I refuse to accept the jurisdiction of the law of the slans. That is final. They all object. That's why we do it forcibly. For their own protection, of course. The older man finished dryly. No doubt you will recognize the reality of our legal jurisdiction after the operation has been performed. His smile faded abruptly. He said in a tight voice, Come to think of it, your objection was very pointed. The laws of zetetic philosophy do not admit of paradox. Either you are a fool, a possibility refuted by your obvious intelligence, or else, in spite of the appearance of your imprisonment, that imprisonment is not actual, and there's only one man in the world who could nullify the hard steel of the handcuffs in that cubicle. Amazingly, the strong face had gone slack. The hard lines were faded but it was the eyes that showed strength now, a glad, eager, wide-eyed joy. He half whispered, Man, man, you have done it, in spite of our being unable to give you the slightest help. Atomic energy, at last. His voice rang out then, clear and triumphant. John Thomas Cross, I welcome you and your father's great discovery. Come in here and sit down. Wait a minute while I get you out of that damn place. We can talk here in this very private den of mine. No one else is ever allowed here except the cleaning woman. The wonder of it grew with each passing minute. The tremendousness of what it meant, this worldwide balancing of immense forces. True slans with the human beings who knew not their masters against the tenderless slans who, in spite of their brilliant far-flung organization, had never guessed the truth behind the mystery. Naturally, said Keir Gray, your discovery that slans are naturals and not machine-made is nothing new to us. We are the mutation after man. The forces of that mutation were at work many years before that great day when Samuel Land's wife gave birth to the three originals. It is only too obvious now in retrospect that nature was building for a tremendous attempt. Cretans increased alarmingly, insanity advanced by enormous percentages. The amazing thing about it was the speed with which that web of biological forces struck everywhere across the earth. We have always assumed far too readily that no cohesion exists between individuals, that the race of man is not a unit, with an immensely tenuous equivalent of a blood and nerve stream flowing from man to man. There are of course other ways of explaining why billions of people can be made to act alike, think alike, feel alike, given a single dominating stimulus. But slant philosophers have, through the ages, been toying with the possibility that such mental affinity is the product of an extraordinary unity, physical as well as mental. For hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, the tensions have been building up. And then in a single stupendous quarter of a millennium, more than a billion abnormal births occurred. It was like a cataclysm that paralyzed human beings. The truth was lost in a wave of terror that swept the world into bloody war. All attempts to revive the truth have been swamped by an incredible mass hysteria, even now after a thousand years. 
Yes, I said a thousand years. Only we true slans know that the nameless period actually lasted 500 hellish years and that Samuel Land's children were born nearly 1,500 years ago before the real wave of births started. So far as we know, not one of those ultra-normal births was exactly like another. Most were horrible failures, and there was only the one perfection from whom all slans are believed to be descended. Nature relied on the law of averages. No preconceived plan existed, simply a reaction to the countless intolerable pressures that were driving men mad, because neither their minds nor their bodies were built to withstand modern civilization. These pressures being more or less similar, it is understandable that many of nature's botches should bear resemblance to each other, without being similar in detail. An example of the enormous strength of a biological tide, and also evidence of the fundamental unity of man, here Gray continued, is shown in that nearly all slans born in the first few hundred years were triplets or, at lowest, twins. There are few such births now. The single child is the rule. The wave spent itself. Nature's part of the work ended. It remained for intelligence to carry on. And that was where the difficulty came. During the nameless period, slans were hunted like wild beasts. There is no modern parallel for the ferocity of human beings against the creatures they considered responsible for the disaster. It was utterly impossible to organize. Our forefathers tried everything. Underground hideouts, surgical removal of tendrils, replacement of human hearts for their own double hearts, the skin-like stuff over tendrils, which I see you have been using. But it was no good. Suspicion was swift beyond all resistance. Men denounced their neighbours and had them medically examined. The greatest difficulty of all was the birth of babies. Even where the successful disguise had been achieved, a baby was always a dead giveaway and frequently brought horrible death to mother, father and upon itself. It was gradually realised that the race could not survive. The scattered remnants of the slans finally concentrated all their efforts on a study of the mutation force, convinced that the solution lay there and at last they find the answer, genes within genes. Sausage-like, infralinks, chains of ultimate life, stuff that control the true genes as the genes in their turn control the shape of the organs. It remained then to experiment. That took 200 precarious years, because with the race at stake, no risks could be taken. We find at last that each of the infragenes controlled a generation. Strike one off the chain, and for one generation the organ affected vanished, only to turn up the following generation. And so we eliminated the double heart for twelve links. Three hundred years. It came back on schedule. We removed thirty links from the chain controlling the tendrils, and they are due back in another forty to fifty years. Cross interrupted with a gasp. Wait a minute. When I first started to search for the true slams, Logic said they were infiltrated into the tendrilus slan organization. Are you trying to tell me that the tendrilus slans are the true slans? Keir Gray nodded, matter-of-factly. Where else could they have come from? At last, Cross said, But why did you ever stop them from knowing the truth? I can see that you still do not recognize the inescapable realities of the lives of our ancestors. The truth was withheld in the first place because it was necessary to observe and study psychological reactions. Because, as people acted not knowing they were true slans, so they would have acted knowing it. What happened? We had removed generations of genes from so many of their distinguishing organs to protect them from predatory human beings. I am similarly protected, though in my case it ends with me, that they had not the strength or energy to be anything but quiet living folk in the remote corners of the world. Then the double heart came back, the superlative nervous system and the muscular strength that went with it, and, in spite of their new powers, they still preferred to lead their peaceful existence. The truth might have aroused them, but not in time. We have discovered that slants are by nature anti-war, anti-murder, anti-violence. We used every argument, but no logic would produce anything more than the general feeling that in a hundred years or so, they could start thinking in terms of action. It was utterly impossible to permit them to stay that way. Human existence had been like a balm fuse. Life burned slowly for millions of years, then the fire reached the balm which exploded. The explosion managed to set another fuse alight, but 
Though we did not know it then, the old bomb and fuse were finished. Now it is certain that human beings will sputter out, vanish from the earth as a result of the sterility that has already started on a vast scale. Undoubtedly, that sterility will be blamed on the slams, and when human beings discover it, there will begin the second great wave of ferocity and terrorism. Nothing but the most powerful organization, expanded at top acceleration under constant and dangerous pressure, could have been properly prepared. And so, Cross said softly, you drove out the tendrilless, the protected, slam with violence that bewildered them, then brought an equally ruthless reaction. Ever since, you've been a spur in their expansion and a check on that artificially engineered ruthless spirit of theirs. But why haven't you told them the truth? The leader smiled grimly. We tried that, but those we selected as confidants thought it was a trick and their logic led them instantly to our hiding place. We had to murder them all. We've got to wait till the tendrils come back. And now, from what you've told me, I can see that we must act swiftly. Your hypnotism crystals, of course, are the final solution to the human being problem. Not one of us but can have pity for their position. Thank heaven, in less than a hundred years, long before the situation becomes acute, there'll be enough tendril slants to hypnotize every human being, and so their passing will be painless and happy. As for the imminent attack, we have spaceships. We shall fit them with your atomic drivers and projectors and make a big noise with a small force. My colleagues have a few tricks of their own that they've been saving for this moment, and the combination, plus a speech by you on the tendril of Slan Radio, should provide us with that 50-year delay. You can tell them that ever since their attack on your valley, human factories have been turning out weapons, but that you have given away no secrets. That should make them feel basically safe. And now, after you've had a look in my mind to verify everything I've told you, what is your father's secret? After a few minutes, Cross smiled and said, Simplicity. My father was always fascinated by the first simple application of atomic energy in the old days. You know the principle. Uranium-235 placed in a boiler heats the water and produces steam to run engines. He rejected the massive cyclotron principle in toto and evolved, finally, a central core of positive electrons spun out like a fine wire. At this core, but not directly at, a proper comparison would be the way a comet comes at the sun in an elongated orbit. This sun, he discharged his negative electron comets at the speed of light. The sun whipped the comets around and flung them out into space, where, and here the comparison to the way the solar system gets completely rid of comets is very real, a second positive core, which might be called Jupiter, and which pulled at the comets already travelling at the speed of light, and catapulted them faster than light completely out of their orbits. At that speed, each electron became matter in a minus state, with a destructive power utterly out of proportion to its size. Normal matter simply goes mad in the presence of this minus stuff, and reverts instantly to a primeval state. It... Cross stopped. Pallor spread over his face. He jumped to his feet, his muscles stiffening, nerves taut, body cold. The door opened lightly and a tall young woman came in. She had flashing eyes, this young woman, and a strong, mature, finely moulded, delicately textured face. And because his mind was always held in a tight band of thought, she came in without knowing he was there. Cross thought piercingly. He should have guessed after the way Mrs. Corliss's smashed head had been repaired by the tendrilous slan doctors. He should have known the moment he discovered Keir Gray was a true slan. Should have guessed, knowing the terrible hates and envies that saturated the palace here, that only death, and a return from death in secret, could ultimately and effectively keep Kathleen forever safe from John Petty. It was at that moment that Keir Gray's voice cut across the silence with the rich tone of one who had secretly relished this instant for years. Jommy Cross, I want you to meet Kathleen Layton, my daughter. The End <laughs>